Couple of announcements before we begin the video. I will be streaming on Twitch for the new dungeon and new season. There's that new gifted sub emblem, and I'm gonna be shameless and say, if you want a place to use it, come by my stream, Evan F1997 on Twitch. Also, I will be casting the three-man dungeon tournament on June 24th with CB Gray as my co-host. Just like Raid Zone, we're gonna cover these teams racing for thousands of dollars. So make sure you guys tune in on June 24th for that day. More details to come soon. After a controversial start to Destiny 1's vanilla game, there was a large split between fans of Destiny. While some fans were incredibly stoked by what the DLC could bring to the table, given that Destiny was this new IP unlike any game out there, others were bothered by the reaffirmations that this DLC would contain cut content from the original vision. Boundary breaks would show that areas from this DLC were already in the game. For instance, this is the Seraphim Vault. You probably heard a lot about this during Destiny's Alpha. Some players were able to glitch into this area. Now, it didn't cause a lot of controversy at the time because we all assumed it would be available in the final game, but of course it wasn't. Now, as you can see inside, there is clearly a build ready to go. Its development was presumably complete or near completion because Bungie felt comfortable enough with it to implement it into the finalized game files. And this was all the way back in the Alpha, which of course would have left them a considerable amount of time to finish it entirely. Additionally, the player base of Destiny was a lot different in that time, so a DLC costing $20 for some extras didn't seem like a great start. As this article pointed out, for how much content is actually on offer here, $20 is almost robbery. For anyone who still plays Destiny day in day out grinding for rare materials and the best gear that Glimmer can buy, this DLC is unsurprisingly for you. And only you. But if you have gripes with Bungie's creation, we dare to say that the Dark Below will do little else other than amplify your scorn. This blame was immediately shifted to Activision for the price, since the producer's reputation wasn't great as it was and would become even worse as time went on. So we have an initial influx of frustration from players over Destiny's original vision shift. We have more players mad that the DLC is already in the game, just locked behind a couple of walls and the $20 cost of a DLC frustrating players. The question then becomes, was The Dark Below really that bad? Our story begins back in 2014. A young Evan on a journey to play games with a tiny mustache and the pew beard growing around a special area. If raid bosses were to die, he would need to shave. But the problem wasn't going to be solved until much later on. You see, after all the cuts and bruises and painful mental scars, a more aged Evan understood that for those eggs to help out in the fight against Atheon, he would need the Manscaped 4.0 Shaver! This video is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped. Scaped man. This video is brought to you by Manscaped. The only place your balls can really trust. Now let's talk about how my balls were saved with the Lawnmower 4.0. Manscaped's fourth generation electric trimmer will not only save your balls, it'll save your marriage. Nah, I'm just kidding, it won't do that. Manscaped's fourth generation trimmer comes with a 4K precise LED light that will make sure you get the very precise shave. Cause let's be real, you and I both know you're gonna need that. Although your balls might look like punching bags, they aren't, so make sure you treat them to a nice spa day. Because this trimmer is waterproof, you can even take it in the shower with you and make sure you get all the nice spots. I was actually using the 3.0 before this, but now that the 4.0 is here, sounds like my balls are gonna have the best day of their life. You wanna go to Manscaped today and get 20% off plus international shipping using promo code EVANF20 at checkout. All right, cool. Thanks, Manscaped. I'm gonna froth up my balls now. You guys won't even know. See you later. See you in the next video. Our other story begins right where Destiny's vanilla story ended. The Vault of Glass was the only place to reach that infamous level 30. And while the story of the next nine years ahead would be frustrating, it was still infinitely possible that mystery is what would fill fans' minds. Sometimes mystery is incredibly powerful, but to feel that, you must have been there, and you must be invested in the ideas the story provides. 
Destiny had always nailed the game part, and when a trailer dropped about the venomous hive armies at the bottom of the Hellmouth, players who were invested in the game eagerly awaited. Only one crawled out. I am Eris, the last. I have seen what the hive call a god. The Dark Below would release with the same problems and same solutions Bungie presented with the vanilla game. A poor story with great surrounding gameplay and plenty of loot incentive in the activities. It felt the same hardships as it did the same benefits. The story was very short this time around, but introduced players to the mysterious Eris Morn, a character whose last name describes who she really is. She escaped the pits of the Hellmouth, stealing the eyes of an acolyte to get out. It was a nice tone setter for the Dark Below, of a more grim and eerie tone. Tone is the best way to describe the villain of this DLC's story. Eris tells you to kill Sardon, the Fist of Crota, before Crota comes back to life. But even if you were to avoid the fact that there was a raid called Crota's End on the way, you'd be surprised to know that the raid came out at the same time as the campaign. So players knew what was going to happen before they even stepped into the first mission. Two difficulties on these missions, normal and hard for some extra XP and loot. What I liked about these missions was that the player had an established clear villain, and Eris gave you the stakes of letting Crota slip through your fingers. Omnigal's screech accompanied by Sardon's apparent power were all you needed, but the mission, just like a lot of RPGs in gaming, suffered from the trope of making a character, in this case Sardon, not match the story background. A knight who shattered the moon for Crota's armies was just a regular knight, but with a mechanic that didn't let you double jump or glide. Destiny had to replace its probable missions from the past and fill in the gaps with story filler, but I can appreciate the added challenge of the Dark Suppression. This was also the era of Bungie not knowing what to do with missions, so you got treated to a sampler of different ideas. After the Fist of Crota is down, it's on to the next sampler of cut content, the Warmind. The mission has a lot of nostalgia for me, as Rasputin was always talked about and his environments were always unique and top-notch. The monologue again establishes exactly what and who Rasputin is, but it is very vanilla on the story here. You must stop the Hive from taking control of Rasputin. Halfway through the mission, you're interrupted by Omnigol, who lets out a scream that just, you know what, just listen. What I always loved was Rasputin playing Tchaikovsky like symphonies while we're killing the Hive. It was like an action movie on full display. You kill some more Hive and you're on to the next mission. The Soul of Crota is the only mission on the moon. Well, sort of, we'll, we'll talk about that later. The biggest compliment I can give this mission is that it feels eerie the whole time. Sounds of Hive tombs creaking open, crackling of bones while you're pushing through. It just felt great. Then when you walk into the Chamber of Night, the voices come into your ear. I think he meant to say, subscribe. And then my favorite line not too long after. Crota, they're waking him. You fight some hive and shoot the rock of Crota, and then the story is over. Wait, story's over? In three missions. How is Crota in the raid if his soul is now dead? Players went back and forth on the reason why, but this Reddit post summed it up pretty well. Pretty sure it's a fragment of his soul in the crystal, and the raid boss is his body being commanded by what's left of his soul. The heir's bounty, at that time, mentions a fragment of Crota's soul is trapped within his vessel, and if you die to Crota, you'll see the red outline on him doesn't cover his head, or a lot of his body, implying that there's bits missing, which if you look closely, you can see in the fact that his head is made of pure energy. Whatever justification you guys need, just know that Crota's in the raid. The story would get laughed at by fans who wanted something deeper, especially given that the game's grimoire lore cards were so engaging. Bungie was still trying to figure out their storytelling for live service, and with the previously mentioned cut content, the Dark Below was no doubt a filler way to incorporate the original story's ideas. The story was pseudo-over, as we had the raid left to finalize it, 
But one portion forgotten about a lot is the Urn of Sacrifice quest, and for good reason. After the campaign was done, this quest was started by killing some specific Hive-ranked enemies, and then buying the Urn from Xur for one strange coin. After completing the Ritual of Forsaken Mission, you get some nice gauntlets for each character. It's forgotten for good reason because this isn't pushed further, and no other pieces of armor that I could find were even there. This was odd, but maybe Bungie wanted Crota to be like Exodia from Yu-Gi-Oh! Because we had the hand, heart, eyes, and balls of Crota! Nice and shaved with Manscaped. Every review I've seen fails to mention how Bungie nailed placing meaningful progression and loot into the Dark Below's rest of the DLC. Because while these three main missions on their own would make for a bad DLC, the Fist of Crota became the best spot to get an exotic quest started. The rumors started to swirl of a common weapon named the Husk of the Pit, and its very rare drop rate. This dropped from the Hive, and the best place to kill the Hive was in the Fist of Crota mission, since there was a higher ranked Hive enemy at the beginning. This weapon would need to be used to level up, since it's how weapons worked in Destiny 1, and this one would need embalming orbs from turning in other materials in the game. These were supposed to be used to rank up weapons from common to rare, rare to legendary, so on and so forth. But it was only used for the Husk of the Pit, and not expanded on at all for the rest of the weapons in the game. Weapons like Murmur gave the players a taste of what the embalming orbs could potentially do, as this legendary fusion rifle was the only legendary weapon in the game to have an arc and solar option on the same gun. It's a real shame embalming orbs couldn't be used any further. But on the Husk of the Pit, after a very long grind, you could upgrade it to the Iodon Alley, a reference to Harry Potter's Diagon Alley. This weapon, once upgraded, needed one last piece of the puzzle, which we will discuss later, so hold on to this thought as we head into our other pieces of content the Dark Below provided. Story was clearly not the focus here, but the dump of new toys to play with and places to use the toys absolutely was. The Dark Below dropped with two strikes, the Undying Mind for PlayStation and the Will of Crota, which was Omnigal's showdown. The Will of Crota may look familiar if you play Destiny 2, as Bungie changed Omnigal to Navoda. There was no strike-specific loot yet, as the Taken King would introduce that about a year later, but these strikes were great for exotic farming, just as the three Crucible maps added were too. Skyshock, Cauldron, and Pantheon were all added here, for the sandbox at the time, and they were all received well. An absurd 13 exotics were added to the list of Destiny, with Hunters receiving the ATS-8 Arachnid, Don't Touch Me, and Radiant Dance Machines. The Arachnid added some nice magnifying glasses to your golden gun. The Don't Touch Me was great for the Hive who you were going to face in the raid, as getting meleeed made you invisible, and the Radiant Dance Machines made you fast while aiming down sight. For Titans, you got the Mark 44 standasides, the Ruined Wings, and the Glass House. Mark 44 standasides in Destiny 1 increased the duration of Shoulder Charge. The Ruined Wings were heavy ammo finders as gauntlets, and the Glass House made Weapons of Light and Blessing of Light bubbles increase in duration. Side note, the Glass House and the Arachnid are still some of the best looking exotics ever made. Warlocks had the Obsidian Mind, the Starfire Protocol, and the Claws of Ahamkara. Obsidian Mine joins the Cool Helmet Club, and it was one of the best exotics in the game, since Nova Bomb kills would give you another Nova Bomb much quicker. Claws gave you an extra melee charge, and Starfire, well, it's not as powerful as it is in Destiny 2, but it does give you an extra fusion nade. In addition to the exotic armor that was a part of the chase and core activities and Xur's loot every Friday, you had iconic exotic weapons. The No Land Beyond was a sniper without a scope, but still zoomed in like it had one, and was a part of every Destiny montage for the year. The Dragon's Breath had unique properties, but it came out at a time where Galahorn existed, so everybody was putting that one on the shelf. And the Fourth Horseman was an obvious choice to big strike bosses, shooting four rounds very quickly. Keep in mind, every exotic armor piece and weapon needed planetary materials to farm from, well, planets, around, and XP from completing activities to activate the perks. This was the loop, and it was either for you or it wasn't. But I found myself enjoying it because Destiny's core grind was so much fun. 
If you had friends that were also on the same page of grinding the game's new strikes and PvP maps, even the older ones in the playlist, this felt great. If not, you were not going to like this DLC. It's important to mention that there was legendary weapons in the Iron Banner, strikes, and PvP that added to the game, like the Longbow Synthesis and the Devil You Don't Know. It's even more important to know that Destiny didn't have a collections tab or a kiosk to pull exotics from, so everything was all word of mouth on where and how to get weapons. Destiny's Reddit would become the main place of discussion past some videos and rumors from friends. The game just felt magical because we were all blissed by the unknown, and the game's tone and activities dropping at random all fed the loop of keeping the mystery alive and well. So far, we have covered story, strikes, PvP maps, exotics, and legendaries, but there is one activity the Dark Below is really known for. The raid, Crota's End. Crota's End, as previously mentioned, released at the same time as the DLC, but would come with a lot of controversy in the future of it. I have covered this raid in a lot of detail if you want to watch the video on the specifics. But let's just say this was the beginning of Crota. Like, Crota's End and King's Fall were um, one thing. Like, they started off as, like, one mega concept that then we we had to, like, split and we had to shelve because the, the end of the game was about the Vex. And, it was, and I was like, the, the raid has to be about the Vex then, too. So we had this big hive thing that we wanted to do. We, we, like, paused that. The raid that was originally supposed to be a piece of a larger raid felt the impacts as a great foundation of a raid was broken by all sorts of cheese and solo challenges. Some of the cheeses and solos still stand out as some of the best of all time. Right here, watch your nuts. Uh, might be a little tricky, not too bad, though. Once you're up here, grab your sword, and now you're going to tighten sword fly. So line yourself up, and it goes jump. RBRT, Twilight Garrison, RBRT, jump. RBRT, Twilight, RBRT, jump. Crota became the meme raid, but I can't help but still enjoy it for the times I had, and I'm happy it exists. It's like comfort food, while other raids are all longer experiences. You just know it's not the best raid, but you know you're gonna have fun while you're in there. The loot like Black Hammer and others were iconic, as Black Hammer would become Black Spindle and then the Whisper of the Worm later in Destiny's history. Hard Mode would be set to level 33 with the goal for players to reach at 32, which not only was great because it kept the challenge of level 33 alive, but it also meant that the Forever 30 could be overcome by players who spent time in either of those raids and went to show that all the complaints of leveling were short-lived. The other reward everyone wanted was the Crux of Crota, an exotic item used to upgrade the Iodon Alley to the Necrochasm. The exotic auto rifle that popped heads like a cursed thrall. This weapon was incredible and was the pinnacle of high rate of fire auto rifles and with nothing in the game like it, yeah, it was pretty great. So with everything out of the way and some others we didn't talk about like cosmetics and balance updates to the sandbox, was the Dark Below really that bad? It's always in the eyes of the beholder, but the Dark Below by today's standards would be a solid DLC for Destiny. It suffered in the story of the game, but Destiny has always suffered this issue, and it's a game after all that was scrapping together pieces from previous ideas. I think the Dark Below received way more hate than warranted at the time, and it felt as if fans were dealing with a bad breakup from the Halo days of Bungie when Destiny clearly established it was in for the long run. The Dark Below nailed the core experience, and to me, it justified its price of $20 for adding a lot more than just those three main missions. 2014 was a different time, and fans had different expectations for Destiny. Maybe it's just what the series has become in the past couple of years, convincing me that the Dark Below was good. Maybe it's nostalgia. But with all the information I've given you, I guess the question is extended to you. Was the Dark Below really that bad? Thanks for watching, and I will continue the series and see you next time.